What's up, guys? Welcome back to another daily Bible reading snapshot. Today, we're looking at Genesis 33 and 34 in the Old Testament. Then we're looking at Matthew 11 here in the New Testament. So here in Genesis 33, we find out, will Esau try to kill Jacob or will he embrace him as a brother? Good news is God blesses Jacob here and gives Esau a favorable view of him and says they embrace each other. They love each other. Esau forgives him of all the stuff that took place, which is interesting. It's pretty big of Esau to do that. But the, the main moral here, he says, look, I have everything I need. God has blessed me beyond measure. I have all these kids. I have all this stuff. I'm not mad at you that you took the blessing anymore because God clearly blessed me too. And that's good news. And Jacob obviously is blessed. He has the special promises of God. But remember, that's something that Esau didn't care so much about. Esau wanted um, the land and, and the stuff. But he got plenty of that, and God blessed him in that way. But they are reunited, so this is good. And remember, Jacob stopped scheming. Remember that? He stopped scheming. So keep that in mind as you read Genesis 34. We have a new generation of schemers. We have this guy named Levi and this guy named Simeon. Two of the sons of, of Jacob are going to scheme and do something. Why do they do that? Well, because something terrible happens. Dinah, which is one of the daughters of Jacob and Levi and Simeon's sister, um, she is in the land and she's taken advantage of by this guy named Shechem, um, this, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, the prince of the land. So one of these guys who's powerful and important seizes her, kidnaps her, defiles her, and says, I want to marry her and falls in love with this, with this girl. Dinah is not having it, obviously. Um, she's completely taken advantage of. This is horrible. God hates what happened here. But then they make it worse by scheming. What's their scheme? Well, they say, well, we can't, we can't have any of the people of Israel, any of these uh, us people, the family of Israel, we can't marry anyone from the land, I guess, unless they're circumcised. So um, I guess if you want to circumcise all the men of your town, then great, we'll, we'll give you Dinah um, to, to marry you. She'll marry you if you get circumcised. So they're like, okay, great. Which again, how did that go for the people in this town? They probably were not super excited about this, that this one prince wanted to marry this one girl. So everyone had to do this surgery so that every, this one guy could get married. Like that's kind of a bummer, but um, they do it because there's a promise that, oh yeah, maybe they'll give their sons and their daughters and we can have this good political relationship. So they do that. And it says, as they are recovering, Levi and Simeon take up the sword and go against this entire city and they kill every single male in this city because they couldn't do much because they were out of commission for a few days and it says as they did this they took the sword and they came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males and it says they took Dinah out of Shechem's house and they went away and the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister they took their flocks and their herds and their donkeys and whatever was in the city and whatever was in the field all their wealth and their little ones and their wives and all that was in their houses, they captured and plundered. So now Levi and Simeon walk away from this city that wronged their sister and they walk away with all this stuff. And Jacob, the former schemer, says to Levi and Simeon, you have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, to the Canaanites and Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. So Jacob is very upset here. And the interesting thing in all this is this kind of sounds like something Jacob would have done in his past life, in his younger days, when he was always scheming and plotting and planning. But now he trusts the Lord, and now he sees how bad this is. And I think it's one of the things we see happen often in the Bible that when someone does something that's bad and it's not corrected, that oftentimes their children take that sin to the extreme. We see that with the kings of Israel. We see that um, sometimes with people like um, Eli. We see that often in the Bible that the sons and the next generation actually takes us into the next level. And we see that here. So God is not happy with this. Jacob's not happy with this, and it's another consequence of sin. So what happened to Dinah was horrible and wrong, and what Levi and Simeon did made the problem even worse. And I think that's a helpful reminder for us. We can't take our feelings and, and let that guide our life, whether it was Dinah, whether that was Levi and Simeon, especially Levi and Simeon. Obviously, Dinah didn't do anything wrong here, um, but Levi and Simeon did. We can't let our feelings dictate our choices because when they do, oftentimes stuff like this takes place. 
Maybe you might say, I'd never, you know, take out a city and kill all the males and plunder all the household. Yeah, you might not, but you could cause a lot of damage. I mean, Book of Proverbs says that life and death is in the power of the tongue. So you can do a lot of damage when you let your feelings control your life too. So that's an important lesson here from today's Daily Bible reading in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we're looking at the chapter Matthew 11, which contains so much about Jesus, how he is comes as the Messiah, the promised Messiah from the Old Testament. We see multiple things quoted here. We see Isaiah 61 quoted. We see Malachi 3 quoted. We see Malachi 4 quoted. We see all these things quoted about Jesus. Now he's the fulfillment of everything that was going on. I just want you to notice in Matthew 11, 2, it says, now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, the deeds of the Christ, that's a really good phrase. The deed, what are the deeds of the Christ? It says, he came to ask, are you the one or shall we look for another? Interesting. He heard that he was doing the deeds of the Christ, but he asked the question, are you, are you the final one? Or is there like two stages to this? Or, or what, what, what should we expect? And Jesus answered them, well, here are the deeds of the Christ, all the stuff that are going on. So just remember, John, these are the deeds of the Christ. What are the deeds of the Christ? Well, Isaiah 61, one says that the, the blind will receive their sight. The lame will walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who's not offended by me. So Jesus quotes the Old Testament and reminds John, remember Isaiah 61? That's the stuff I'm doing. So don't worry about the next step in all this. Then Jesus turns to the crowds and says, look, you guys should have listened to John the Baptist. I know a lot of you did, but some of you didn't listen to John the Baptist. Some of you didn't repent when he told you to. But he's the Elijah that was talked about in the book of Malachi. He's the one that the, the scriptures were looking forward to, the, the one who's going to make a preparation for the Messiah. He was the one. And the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So he's the, the best person ever born, Jesus says about John the Baptist. But even in heaven, the righteousness, the, the perfection that's going to take place, even the least, the smallest, will be better than John the Baptist. Amazing promise for all of us to really grasp right there. Then he says, what shall I compare this generation to? Um, and then he, he gives this interesting thing here about how they're like children who um, say, we played the flute for you and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge and you didn't mourn. Um, the point is, their hard hearts lead to their wrong responses. We see that again at the end of chapter 11, where he talks about the unrepentant cities, Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum. Um, he says, you guys had the wrong hearts, which led to the wrong responses. You, when, when I was eating food, you said, oh, well, look at the glutton. When I was fasting, they said, what's this weirdo out in the, out in the desert? The whole point is they had wrong responses to Jesus. And one thing we can learn is when people have wrong responses to Jesus, when they don't submit to them, when, when they don't humble themselves before him, when they don't repent of their sin, when they don't have faith in him, all of that is indicative of a hard heart. All of it just points back to people's hearts to say their hearts are not right before God. It all shows. We live out of our hearts. We act out of our hearts. We speak out of our hearts. And if we have bad responses to Jesus, that's because our hearts were wrong. And then Jesus says, but those of you who have the right heart, those of you that have soft hearts, uh, I just praise God that he's hidden these things from the wise and, and the noble and the people who are smart in the world. And he's revealed it to these, these poor, innocent, weak people who are not really that righteous. They're not really that innocent. They're innocent in the fact that they, they don't know their right hand from their left, that they're, they're, they're in the wrong. But he says, look at them. God has revealed amazing things to them. He says here in verse 27, all things have been handed over to me by the father and no one knows the son except the father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Look at this. Jesus is saying, you can't know God unless I tell you who he is. So Jesus has to reveal the Father to us. We see that over and over again in the book of John, especially John chapter 1, verse 18. It's just, you know, red flashing lights there. But then Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If only you had a soft heart and would respond to Jesus. Jesus says, I will save you. My, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. While all these people in the world are trying to say, this is how you should follow God. Jesus says, you got to repent of your sins and trust me. And Jesus will restore a right relationship between sinners and the sinless, perfect God. And he will make that restoration happen. So he says, follow me, follow me. That's the key. So as you read this, and as you see like this John the Baptist narrative and all this stuff about Jesus fulfilling prophecy and all about 
you know, this evil, hard-hearted generation. Just, I want you to say, I don't want to have a hard heart. I want to respond rightly to Jesus and believe what is written about him in Matthew chapter 11. So thanks for reading. We'll see you back tomorrow for another daily Bible reading snapshot. Thank you.